Every year when it gets really, really cold, I wish I wasn't here. Well, in Ohio at least, maybe somewhere a little bit warmer. But when it gets really cold and I'm in pain, I can't help but think about how heaters work as I huddle around one with a blanket on. And we're very fortunate this video that Perfect Air sent me a pallet of heaters to test. So in this video, we're gonna test every single one of these types of heaters and then test them in this room just to see how well each of these heat and run some of the cool tests or fun tests that I like to do on the channel, but also show how they work and what the difference is between all of these. So get ready today. We're gonna to do something a little bit different than appliances, but I think this will be equally as fun and informational and maybe something will blow up in the process, but hopefully not this trailer. Here's how we're setting the tests up. I'm putting an Elitech data logger on each side of my video room. Every test, we're going to run four of these loggers plus one outside to show what the low temperatures were for that day. Then once the test is over for that day, we're going to show the temperatures and electricity usage in kilowatt hours. Now, this isn't a perfect scientific test, but I figure that this would at least be able to help you understand how the different styles of heaters work in practice at your house. Let's go ahead and start these tests with an oil-filled heater. These are the most simple form of heaters that you can buy, and they remind me of the kind you'd see like in old movies taking place in old New York apartment complexes. These oil-filled heaters are without a doubt the most basic, crude, fantastic in some cases, heaters you're ever going to find. They're large and heavy, but the advantage with them is that there's no moving parts which make them very reliable to use. And once we start tearing this one apart, there's only a handful of actual things inside. They have an anti-tipping switch, a thermostat, and then a switch to regulate the electricity, and then a thermal safety fuse, which is really interesting to me as an appliance tech because it's quite literally identical to the one that you would see on like a Samsung dryer. Here's one side by side for comparison and reference. They're essentially identical, with the only real difference being the value of temperature needed before the fuse is tripped, which would kill this heater or any heater's ability to continue working. It's a switch of last resort, so the only way to get the heater to work again would be to buy a new one, and if the heater breaks, chances are this is what actually goes bad unless the heating element blew up. The only other piece in this unit is a giant heating element. This is what heats the oil up to distribute the heat through the entire unit. The advantage here is that with no moving parts, it's super reliable. All the energy is used to simply generate heat to warm your house where it sits. But don't take my word for it. Let's see how this works on a thermal camera for a few minutes. As electricity flows through the heater, the element heats the oil up, which then flows through the radiator, causing it to slowly heat up over time. Since this unit maxes out at 1500 watts, it heats the air up kind of fast, but there are some drawbacks. There's no fan to move the air, so this style relies on convection to distribute heat the same way a typical oven does without a fan. This style causes a room to heat up a little bit more slowly, but does so without the noise a fan would bring or the electricity consumption that that fan would have. Every watt of electricity instead goes to the element rather than an oscillating motor or fan blade. And for reference, this unit uses almost exactly 1500 watts when it's in full operation. Now let's let the heater run overnight and check the temperatures in the morning. When we came back to the trailer and uploaded the data loggers to the PC, here's what we found. The oil-filled heater was able to raise the temperature on the data loggers by 10 degrees in 44 minutes. Within an hour and 32 minutes, it rose 13 total degrees, so an additional 3 degrees on top of the 10. The average delta between the inside and outside temperature overall was about 29.7 degrees Fahrenheit. But this came at a cost of 19.8 kilowatt hours of electricity. The total amount of the time of the test was just over 16 hours, so the unit consumed on average about 1.23 kilowatts per hour. Is this good? Well, let's try another heater and see. The most common, popular, cheap kind of unit is a fan with a wire heater in it. When tearing this fan down, only two screws held it in place. Once separated, there are only a few components in it, much like the oil-filled heater. It almost identical sensors for temperature and shutoff. Then the key of this kind of unit is a heavy-duty metal fan blade that won't melt. I think half the weight of this unit is just the metal fan blade, but it was really easy to take this apart and get all the components out for us to see. Once removed, the fan separates from the wire assembly, which you can see was mounted on the inside of the fan itself. What is so interesting about wire heaters is how common they are. There are all kinds of different heaters that use these wires, 
and it almost doesn't matter if it's a hair dryer or a tumble dryer like the GE dryer we took apart a few weeks back, they all generally work the same way. The fans draw in the heat and force it out into the air to warm the space, but they have different amounts of wattage consumption that they can have. Another interesting part of this cheap wire heater was the anti-tip sensor. The switch is one of the most common pieces of electrical equipment in history, and if the button isn't simply pressed in, the unit shuts off. But there's another kind of anti-tip switch that some of these other units have that we're going to show you in just a minute. But going back to the fan heater, the temperature began to skyrocket as soon as we plugged it in and used it. If you watch the FLIR footage, notice not only the fan temperature, but the floor in front of it and the power wire behind it. You can see the heat from the wire heater carve a path in the room as it continues to run and run. This is how and where such heaters could potentially benefit or create problems because you see a lot of the heat is being wasted on the floor itself. Now when it comes to charting how this worked over the course of a night, it raised the room temperature by 10 degrees in just 28 minutes on average between the four sensors, and it went to 13 degrees in 40 minutes which was superior to the oil-filled heater. The heating action pushed the graph to a higher peak than the oil-filled heater overall with an average delta of 39.7 degrees Fahrenheit between the inside and outside. However, over the 17 hours we ran it, it drew 25.7 kilowatt hours of electricity or 1.51 kilowatts per hour average through the night. And you also see that it regulating the temperatures down so it wasn't an even heat throughout the night. Next, let's go to this new heater that was my favorite to test of anyone that I had in this video. This is a radiant heater. They're a little bit more pricey than the wire or the oil filled heater, and you can get these at any Ace hardware, like the other Perfect Air heaters we've tore down in this video, so they're quite easy to find despite the fact they're kind of new and fancy. On the teardown of this unit, there's not much to it. When the protective grill is off, it's just a giant metal dish, and once we take the back plate off with the back of the dish exposed, it has a thermal protector, just like the oil heater did, and an element at the very top of the housing encased in glass, uh, like a quartz element. The rest of the dish is just a thin sheet of metal, but what makes this actually special? Well, it works radically different than any of the other units so far. The unit does not use a fan. It has a small motor that you can oscillate the dish, which takes about 10 watts of electricity to use. But unlike a heater with a fan, the glow that you see from this radiant heater is converting the heat into the infrared spectrum, beaming it silently to every surface in the room which bypasses the air. That means that even without a fan, I can stand five feet in front of the heater and it feels incredibly hot without any noise and this felt very strange to use in person. It's the same way that the sun would heat the earth. Infrared radiation warms the surface of the earth, which then afterward warms the air. It's why you can be outside on a very cool day without the wind, but stand in direct sunlight and suddenly feel warm even though it's super cold still. Now, in order to initiate all these processes, the particular radiant heater we have works like any other heater. The dish heats up on the FLIR camera quite well, even at 800 watts. Then once it reaches temperature, it projects the infrared waves to the various corners of the room. For our test, I didn't use the oscillation feature though, which could have potentially distributed the heat slightly better, but I wanted to do this due to power consumption. One catch with this kind of heater though, before we get to the temps, is the eerie glow. When it's running, some of the electricity isn't converted to the heat, but light. For this type of unit, you have to deal with the brightness. Higher end infrared heaters, though, will keep this glow inside a box or a housing as not to brighten the room. Overall, the radiant heater was the slowest heater that we used of the four, raising the temperatures by 10 degrees in 1 hour and 6 minutes, and a total of 13 degrees in 3 hours and 6 minutes. But a note, on this unit is that the maximum output of electricity was much lower than the other units. It used 14.4 kilowatts in 17 hours of use for an average of 847 watts per hour, at least according to our kilowatt meter. The delta on this unit, which I found very fascinating, was that there was a 28.1 degree Fahrenheit delta, which is really, really good compared to the amount of wattage it used, so it was more efficient than these other heaters that we've tested so far. For our fourth heater, we have a quote-unquote ceramic heater. This is definitely the most complex unit that I'm tearing down and reviewing today, which 
kind of justifies the fact that the price on these is a little bit more than the other basic heating units. With the plastic cover off, there's so much more to unpack in this very small unit. It has a standard thermostat and switches like all the other units had, but the blower housing is much different than the simple metal fan we saw earlier on the wire heater. When you take it out, the motor and the fan housing is a lot lighter too, although I didn't weigh them. The heating element for this unit is placed in front of the fan, so the air blows through the fan to the heater hiding right behind the mesh cover. For anyone interested, here's a picture of the ceramic heater. It is a 1500 watt heater by Mydea. Once we have the heater out of the way, we've worked through most of the components of the internals of these different units. The heater is fully removable, and what's the point of a ceramic wire heater though? The PTC heater or the positive temperature coefficient heater is a self-regulating heater. They're more expensive to produce than a wire element, like we saw earlier, but they're safer and they won't heat up too hot. When heat is passed through the element, it acts like a radiator to distribute the heat. It's a little bit more complex than that, but that is the simple way of explaining it. One of the other things that was really cool in this machine is the anti-tipping mechanism. The wire heating element one had a push button switch which was less sophisticated, and I do a bad job of taking this apart, but when you split this apart, it has that same identical switch, but instead of a push button and lever system, it has a lever and ball bearing. So when the unit is rolled in any direction, the bearing moves, breaking contact with the switch, turning the heater off, and it also led for a much more sophisticated, sensitive anti-tip switch because you barely had to move it to get it to break contact. On the infrared camera, the unit raises temperatures extremely quick, but then it regulates itself to about 130 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit in about five or six minutes. One huge advantage of the ceramic heaters, again, is the self-regulating temperatures. It does this as a great safety mechanism, but it still provides a ton of heat. For the ceramic heater data, it managed to heat up 10 degrees Fahrenheit within just 24 minutes, and then it heated up 13 degrees in 36 minutes, which is very impressive. Overall, it kept the room about 44 degrees warmer than the outside thermostat we placed, but on the power consumption side, it used 26 kilowatt hours of electricity in 17 hours and 36 minutes. It pulled 1.47 kilowatts on average per hour through the testing. And with all four heaters tested, here's the chart that I found very interesting on how they ran in terms of temperature deltas. With the hours of electricity used, and the average consumption numbers. All manufacturers will tell you that each type of heater has different advantages and disadvantages, and you can make of this what you will. Also, here is a chart of the average data logging temperature of the room we tested with all four heat averages compared. In the end, when the data is compared with power consumptions, they all show that the heaters generally had a similar heat pattern based on power output and outdoor ambient temperature variations. In general, electric heaters tend to output the same amount of heat due to how electric resistance works, but how they flow throughout a room on each machine varies greatly, and I hope in this video that it helps educate you a little on how this process works, and I hope to do another video or two on these because I really had too much fun with the radiator heater, so I will have more content like this in the near future, and have a great day.